Okay, welcome to class. Okay, so today let's talk about learning objectives first and then we'll do the quicker quiz. So if you just come in, be getting logged on, you can see the channel ID and the session ID, you can get ready for the first quicker quiz. Meanwhile, our learning objectives for today, we're going to pick up where we left off last time, which was with the eutectic binary phase diagram. And we're going to learn the next thing, which is, all right, if I gave you a blank one of those where nothing was labeled on it, could you go ahead and label it? And there's some tricks for that. We'll then talk about a series of important reactions that can take place in phase diagrams. There's not just the eutectic, there's other things like eutectoid, paratectic, and, other, and so forth. Um, we'll learn how to identify the formula of intermediate compounds. So it's not just like AB, but you can form maybe AB in the middle of that. We'll talk about how we identify formulas. We'll briefly uh, talk about ternary phase diagrams. We'll spend time describing the lever rule and how it describes the amount of the different phases present at any point on the diagram. Um, we'll describe the lamellar structure, what, what are grains, and we'll even practice drawing some of these things. And if we have time at the end, we'll go over some examples of all that in the context of steel. Uh, the, the steel phase diagram, or iron carbon, is one of the most important ones for us to know in this class. We're going to come back to it over and over and over throughout the course of the semester. So a real quick announcement before we do the clicker quiz. There's about 10 or 15 students, and I've got the lists of you guys, but you can see just as easily who it is. If you haven't finished registering, you should be getting all zeros for your clicker assignments on Canvas. Um, as soon as you register, we can backdate those assignments with the scores that you got. So don't worry, we have a record of what you did, but it won't show up on Canvas until you finish the, your clicker registration process. So you either didn't register your device or you didn't buy a subscription. One of the two things. So if you have a bunch of zeros for your clicker assignments on Canvas, come talk to me and we can figure out which, which problem it is, okay? After class or, uh, or sometime is fine. Okay, let's start with a quicker exam for today, or reading quiz for today. Let me make this bigger. Okay, first question says, how many degrees of freedom exist at the eutectic point? And I'll just do a quick reminder that degrees of freedom, that has to do with Gibbs phase rule, which is P plus F equals C plus N, where P is the number of phases, F is our degrees of freedom, C is the number of constituents or components, and N is the number of non-compositional variables. So at the eutectic point, is it 0, 1, 2, or 3? Okay, another 30 seconds, wrap up on this one. Okay, we're gonna wrap it up. Is it zero, one, two, or three? It is definitely zero. The reason we know it's zero, again, at the, at the eutectic point, that's where this reaction takes place. A liquid reverses between alpha plus beta. So you've got three distinct phases in equilibrium at that point. Therefore, you've got three plus F. There's two components in these diagrams, so it's gonna be two plus Temperature is the only thing we plot it against, so F has to be zero. There's no degrees of freedom. And what this really says is we can't move anywhere on that diagram and still be at the point on the plot, which makes sense. All right, let's do our next one. Professor? Yeah. So why is it two plus one? So if you look at C plus N, C is the number of constituents in the system. Because we're talking about a eutectic, that has to be a binary phase diagram. It doesn't exist on a unary phase diagram. And so you have at least two components, right? You have A, pure A going to pure B. Right, so that's that's two, and then the number of non-compositional variables. You could do this against either pressure or temperature, or technically you could do it against both. But as we described in last class, it's almost always just against temperature. So that's just one. So three plus f equals two plus one. F has to be zero. All right, our next question is the following: 
How many degrees of freedom exist along the solidus line? Let me remind you what the solidus line was. The solidus line, say if we we're going between copper and nickel again, where you've got liquid, a solid plus liquid, and a solid. The solidus line refers to this line right there. Right? So along that solidus line, it's asking how many degrees of freedom do you have there? Another 30 seconds, get your answers in. Okay, we're going to wrap this poll up. How many degrees of freedom exist along the solidus line? People think, yeah, one degree of freedom. What this, again, what this means is that on this diagram, if you want to change something, either composition or temperature, you can only choose one of those, and then the system will choose the other one. If you want to go down in temperature, then the composition has to go over in order for you to exist on that solidus line still, is what that's saying, okay? And then the last question, how many degrees of freedom exist in the bottom central region of a binary eutectic diagram? For example, in this region one, how many degrees of freedom exist there? This one's a little bit tricky, so make sure you actually punch this in and think about it. Okay, another 30 seconds. So I was afraid most people would guess two here. It's actually one. Let's go through it. And don't worry, on a question like this where most people get it wrong, I'll go back through and I can make either answer correct. Right, and it'll retroactively give you a point for this. So don't worry about it. Let's talk about why it's two. So if you've got a binary eutectic, they typically look something like this, right? We're talking about this region down here in the middle. If we were to label this, it would be liquid, alpha, beta. This would be alpha plus beta. So if you're at some region in here, say at that point, we're going to do P plus F equals C plus N. How many phases are present at that point? Two phases plus F. How many components are present in this binary phase di uh, eutectic diagram? Just two. And then how many non-compositional variables is there? Just one. So F actually has to be one. Question, Matt? That's a great question, yeah. Does alpha plus beta count as a phase? No. Phases are individual different types of crystal structures, which we'll be describing next uh, in two chapters, actually. So alpha plus beta 
that is a mixture, that's a multi-phase mixture. And again, if you put two degrees of freedom, don't worry, we'll give you credit on this one. We're gonna talk about um, multi-phase regions a little bit more. Another question? So very good question. Why are they both not solids? So they are both solids. The eutectic reaction is one liquid converting into two different solids. But one of the key things we talked about, for example, with the iron wire demo, is that a solid is not a solid is not a solid, right? There's differences between them. In the case of iron, the high temperature phase, even though they're both solids, the high temperature version of the iron has a different crystal structure that causes it actually to contract, right? So one of the key things I want to get across to engineers is that when we talk about different phases of matter, different crystal structures or different ways that we arrange atoms, that, constitute, that constitutes a different phase, and those are important. They have different physical properties, mechanical properties. Uh, Josh? Can you share a point on that graph where something is two degrees of freedom? So where would it have two degrees of freedom? Well, we can work backwards. How about that? Where would it have two degrees of freedom? Um, let's do P plus two degrees of freedom equals two plus one, right? In order for this to work, we would need to be in a region that has just one phase present. So right here in the alpha region, in the beta region, or in the liquid region, we would have two degrees of freedom. Because those are all single phase fields. So in any of those three regions, we'd have two degrees of freedom. And what does that really mean? It means that we can go left or right, or we can go up or down, and we still just have liquid, right? But if we try and do that here, what we do is we, we, we still have alpha plus beta, but we change the amounts of alpha and beta, and that's what's key, right? If you're right here, you have a different amount of alpha and beta than if you're right here. And the way that we know how to do that is with the lever rule, which we're gonna talk about today. Conrad? But then if you're just in the alpha phase, right? Okay. And you go up. Okay. Then, I mean, technically, your, your, the alpha phase is like, your A would be incorporated, and when you go up, you can put more B in. So still yeah, so it. composition can change, but Gibbs phase rule doesn't talk about composition. It talks about equilibrium of phases, not composition of those phases. Yeah. So it talks about the amounts of each phase, right? That has to do with equilibrium, but not the composition. Yeah, Rob? Wait, so if you, yeah, C is 2 because up and beta are both present, right? No, C is 2 because in this system, we're having a mixture between pure A and pure B, so there's two possible constituents, okay. right? Sure. A and B. That could be copper and nickel, that could be whatever else, right? Okay, um, and then so is that why P is 2? So P is 2 because depending on where you place in this diagram, there might be two phases present. Yeah, okay, so it's and in this field right here, there's two phases present. Yeah. There's also two phases present right here, mm -hmm. alpha plus liquid, and in here, beta plus liquid. So it's the maximum number of phases present at one point in the diagram, that's the total? No. F is, so we can only use Gibbs phase rule at a certain point on the diagram, not for the entire diagram. It exists for certain points. Can I answer more questions about this? Yeah, Logan. When would n equal 2 or 3? When would n equal 2 or 3? If we had a diagram that, so this is plotted in two-dimensional space. If you made a 3D model where you not only had temperature going up, but you had pressure coming out, then I suppose you could have um, more degrees of freedom because then you'd have more than one non-compositional variable. So we don't typically do that, but you could. Uh, at the end of class today, I'll show you a ternary phase diagram where we're briefly going to talk about that. Other questions? Yeah, uh, John? Yeah, so if you have one degree of freedom, that means you can move in one dimension and the composition won't change, is that correct? One degree of freedom means you can either choose to go left or right by changing your composition, or you can choose to go up or down, but you can't do both. Meaning if you do one, the system says, all right, if you still want to maintain equilibrium, I get to choose the next thing, right? So for example, let me choose, change the color real quick. If you're on this line, then you have a mixture of alpha and alpha plus liquid, right? That's the reaction. That's what that line represents. So if you choose to change your composition and add some of component B, and you still want to maintain that mixture, the same mixture that you had before, then you have to go down, right? That two-phase field, it says that alpha and liquid are still there, but if you want to maintain the same amounts of them as were present on that line, then you have to still be on that line. Can I ask more questions? Yeah, Rosa? No, this isn't about the system like taking an action and changing what's in your beaker. What this is saying is that if you want to maintain equilibrium, if that's the goal, then you only have a limited number of options and actions that you can take and still maintain equilibrium. That's all you this is saying. Yeah, if if you wanted to maintain the exact same ratio, say of alpha and beta. 
right here. You were, you were right there and you wanted to change the temperature. You wanted to go up a little bit and you still wanted to have the exact same ratio of alpha and beta. You'd have to change your composition slightly to be right there. And we'll talk about how we know that it's right there when I get to the level today. Other questions I can answer about this? Yeah, um, Elsa? Yes, um, can you explain, so with your one degree of freedom, how you're saying you're working in one direction is permissible? Okay, so if you want to... Can you just explain how that works in the alpha plus beta? In the alpha plus beta. Uh, let me get to the lever rule, and then it'll be easier. Okay. okay? Can we move on? And then we'll come back to this if there's more questions. Let's do lever rule, and if there's still questions, we'll keep going, okay? Um, first, let's talk about how we go about labeling these phase diagrams, right? Let's, let's label one that's kind of weird. Um, well, yeah, let's start with a paratectic, actually. Let's label this one. In a paratectic phase diagram, it might look something like this. Okay? Um, okay? How would you go about labeling this phase diagram? Again, we're going from pure component A all the way to pure component B, and it's against temperature that we're plotting it. So when you label these phase diagrams, the rule is the following. When you go left to right, or right to left, at a constant temperature, you have to go one, two, one, two, one, two. You have to alternate between single phase region and two phase region, single phase region and two phase. Now, the way you get started, the easiest way to always get started on these is to start really up high. Up high, everything's going to be molten, so it's going to be liquid, right? So at the top of your phase diagram, that's where you start this unit right liquid. Now at any given temperature, I'm going to switch a different color here. If I pick a temperature, say right here, and I go left to right or right to left on this diagram, I need to go from a single phase region to a two phase, back to a single phase to a two phase. So out here, that is clearly going to be a liquid still. That's in the same phase field as the liquid. So we've got liquid over here. That's a single phase. That means what about this region in between? It must be a two-phase region. So we're going to say that this is actually liquid plus, and we get to pick a Greek letter, any one you want. Use a weird one. Use zeta if you want, right? The convention is to start with alpha, but do whatever you like, right? So that means if you keep on going left, that must be a single phase region. And because you label these things with what's on either side of it, you've got liquid on one side, that means that this must be your zeta phase. Okay? Again, zeta is just great Z, right? So then how do you keep going? How do you fill out the rest of this? Well, now you know that this whole region here, that's all a single phase region, which means what about this phase? This is actually two phases, right? So we can give it a name. It's going to be zeta plus what? Pi, somebody said? Great. Pi. Pi is a great name, right? So that's our second phase there. We don't know what these phases are yet, but we know it's distinct. It's distinct from zeta, right? What do we know about this thing then? That must be just pure pi, right? What about this phase? Pi plus what? Let's do pi plus gamma. We'll see if this works. What would then this region be? There's a problem. Oh, I drew my. That's not supposed to be there. <laughs> Sorry. That's my fault. Now, we knew it was a problem because we're doing this 1, 2, 1, 2 rule. It didn't work. Our rule didn't work, so we knew that, that didn't work. This had to be pi here. My mistake. That's pi, which makes this region what? That must be pi plus liquid. My mistake. Pi plus liquid there, right? This diagram, the reason we draw this to talk about labeling phase fields is because there's a new reaction that we have to talk about. It's the paratectic reaction. So just like the eutectic reaction, this is another special type of reaction. In this case, it's one solid reacting with a liquid to form a new type of solid. So where in this diagram do we see one solid reacting with a liquid to form a new type of solid when you go up or down in temperature? Yeah, the formation of pi. Right? So right here at this point, as you go down in temperature there, it's only briefly, but you're going to have the equilibrium of liquid plus zeta and pi. So that would be a paratectic point. Now in this reaction, if you were to keep on going down, you'd only be in pi for just a moment, and then you'd cross over to pi plus zeta. But sometimes these, these uh, diagrams look more like this. Let me erase that. They can look like this instead, like that. In either case, it's still a paratectic point. Okay? Any questions about paratectic points? Yeah, Rosa? Um, so, which 
Yeah, for example, if you were cooling it down, I'm going to switch a different color to talk about cooling things down here. If you start out with a composition of liquid up there, right? So liquid with, with that given composition, and you slowly cooled it down, as soon as you touch that, what's called the liquidus line, your very first solid starts to crystallize, at least from a thermodynamic perspective. Again, we'll talk about kinetics, actually, means it happens later, but from a thermodynamic standpoint, it should start to form your very first solid. And as you slowly cool it through this region, you're going to have a mixture of liquid plus zeta present. And we don't know how to say how much yet because we haven't learned the lever rule, but we're going to do that in just a moment. But as soon as you get to this paratectic temperature, that flat line, and then go below it, your liquid and zeta disappear and you're left with just pi. Okay? And because that happens where you had one solid and one liquid converting to a different type of solid, that's a paratectic reaction. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, Brad? What's the difference between the paratectic points and the... The eutectic? Yeah, let's go back up. The eutectic happens right here, where again, if you're cooling it down, you went from one liquid simultaneously to two different solids, which is different than going from one liquid and one solid to a different type of solid. Fair enough? Yeah, remember your name. What is it? Cody. Cody. Is it also the other way where you go from one solid? Yeah, so just like a reaction, chemical reactions can go forwards or backwards. This reaction, if you were to take it and you were to heat that thing up and melt it into a mixture of liquid plus zeta, it's still a paratectic reaction. It's just one that you're heating up rather than cooling down. Uh, Takara. So at that point, would you have the high phase, the zeta phase, and the... At that point, you would have all three in equilibrium. So your degrees of freedom would be zero. You can't change anything. And that makes sense, because this point only occurs at one point on our map here. Not along a line or anything or anything like that. Yep, uh, remember your name? Kyle. Kyle. So, Kyle is going to all of the composition Good question. Pi represents this entire phase field, and because this is not a single line where it occurs at, this means that this crystal structure must be relatively compliant. It can allow a pretty big mixture. If this was plotted in like mole percent, it can go all the way to pure B, whatever that element is, bismuth, whatever it is, and you can stuff in, you can take out half the bismuth atoms and put in whatever atom A is and keep the same crystal structure. That doesn't mean that the, the lattice won't change. If you remember from Bagard's law last time, the, the, the separation between atoms can change, but the type of crystal structure does not change. Therefore, it's still one phase. It's just one phase that can exist over a, a pretty big variety of compositions. Yeah. So let's say you're, you're from a liquid from zeta, and say the line below it actually kind of curves, the pi actually curves out of the way, and you go right down into zeta plus pi. If it went it's, that way? If, if that, yeah. The yeah, line. if this line wasn't here, but it went how yeah. I originally had it. And okay. to zeta, is it still zeta plus It's still pi. a paratectic point, still but if you were to cool straight down, you would actually only exist at that paratectic point for a moment, and then you'd cross into a two-phase field. Okay. So that's going to put a two a liquid and one solid to a different type of solid. That has to, that's a paratectic reaction. Okay. By the way, this is you're going to start to see things on phase diagrams that are indicators that something's up. Anytime you see a perfectly vertical line or a perfectly horizontal line, those are points to pay attention to. Something's happening there. Horizontal lines represent one of these key reactions, and vertical lines we'll get to actually I think next. Can I move on, or are there more questions? Yeah, one more, Jeff. So basically, yeah, uh, if you were right here, you're going to have a mixture of liquid and zeta. If you cool it down, what we're going to find out is that the paratectic reaction occurs all the way along this horizontal line. What does that mean? It means whatever amount of liquid you have right here, as soon as you cool below that line, all of that liquid must undergo the paratectic reaction. Right? But you had some zeta from before. That zeta doesn't have to change. The liquid has to change because that's what the paratectic reaction says. Fair enough? Oh, I'm sorry. Paratectic means it's some of the zeta and some of the liquid. But definitely all of your liquid has to be gone. Other questions I can answer about this? We're going to do lots and lots of examples, so let's keep going. Um, okay. What if an intermediate compound forms, right? Up until now, we've been showing A and B, right? But let's talk about what if an intermediate compound, what if, what if A wants to react with B? So first off, what causes the formation of an intermediate compound? Or in other words, another way to think of it is what prevents solid solutions. So turn to a neighbor and talk about 
why should a new react a new compound form in the first place? Why can't it just dissolve all the way across? Okay, what do we think? Why should a new compound form? Anyone uh, hazard a guess or volunteer what your neighbor said if you're feeling shy? Griffin, what, what do you think? Well, different materials have like, different interactions with temperature, and so like one thing might cool down at a lower temperature than another. Okay, yeah, different melting points and boiling points, things like that. Yep, that's fair. What else? What else can cause a reaction to form? Well, how about this one? Oh yeah, Quite, or is it uh, Connolly? No, it's time to say. Not even close. <laughs> By the way, it is so warm in this room. Something I'm dying. Gives free energy. Something about energy, you say? It gives free energy. Yeah, clearly, if it happens, it's because what happens to Gibbs free energy? It goes down. It, something happened to lower the Gibbs free energy. So, what might happen to lower the Gibbs free energy? So, I think one of the easiest ways to think about this copper and nickel, we know that they have a complete solid solution. Because both of these have the same crystal structure to start with, with just slightly different lattice parameters. And so because they're so chemically similar and everything, you can just substitute for another all the way across and you end up with at alpha. Right? But what if you start with something that just fundamentally has a different crystal structure? Right? You've got alpha, which is maybe cubic, and this one, which is hexagonal. You cannot, by definition, go all the way across and keep the same crystal structure. So you at least have to have something like a binary. Now, why do they react to form some new compound? Typically, this is due to what? Anybody want to take one last guess? It wants to bond. What makes things want to bond? Yeah, well, lowers the energy. Lowers the energy, right? Yeah, either you have ionic or covalent driving forces, right? So maybe there's a big difference in electronegativity. If your atom A and atom B have a big difference in electronegativity, we know that that should lead to an ionic bond where there's this exchange of electrons, right? So that typically is one reason. If you have very different oxidation states, if this is typically two plus and this is three plus, that usually leads to the formation of an, of an intermediate. So there's a couple of rules that the book talks about. Um, but what I'm interested in teaching you guys is how do you predict the formula of one of these lines? If you look up a phase diagram and all it says is, it shows this vertical line. First off, how is that a new phase if it's a vertical line, right? Because this seems like it breaks our one, two, one, two rule, right? If you look at this, let's label this one. Let's label this phase diagram. At the top, we have liquid. So those are liquid regions. Well, that means this must be liquid plus alpha, but where is alpha? What this means is that pure A basically has no, you can't have any solubility of atom B in A, right? It'd be as if this was like a, a single phase region there, but it's so narrow, it looks just like a line, okay? So pure A is in the crystal structure of alpha. So that line itself is a single phase region. That means that this is then going to be alpha plus what? Let's call it beta, right? And then if you did the, the one, two, one, two rule, one, two, if that's a one, this would have to be a two phase field as a line. That doesn't work. So it's the exact same thing on the other side. Let's call this liquid plus gamma. That means that this line is gamma. Again, what that means is that pure A is so intolerant of atom B for whatever reason, it doesn't allow any solid solubility. You can't dissolve any of atom B in A or A and B, right? That makes sense? Now you can complete this. You can say that this is gamma plus beta. Therefore, this compound right there, that line, must be a single phase region of what we're going to call crystal structure beta. Any questions about this? Thomas? What kind of phase is that one? It's not a regular phase. Well, it's just a phase. It's a solid phase. Um, this is still in a binary crystal system, right? Because it's still just two components, A and B. It's just a third. It's in what we call an intermediate compound. It's something that forms. These two things react to form a compound in between them. And I'll show you some examples on a real phase diagram in a moment. 
Does it make sense how you can have a single vertical line that represents a phase? Logan? Um, so if you were to heat that phase up. Beta? Yeah. Okay. Right? You're exactly at 50 50 mole percent of beta. Yeah. Uh, what happens? Does it go to liquid? That's a great question. As you heat this thing up, what happens as you cross that line? It would go completely 100% beta to 100% liquid at this temperature, okay. at its melting point. And that's called a congruent melting point. We'll talk about that in a, probably later today or, or on Wednesday. Other questions I can answer about this? Yeah, Reza? So A means that it doesn't, that none of these, the A could at, at pure A, this means that of all your atoms, they're all one type. And the type is atom A. Same thing at, at B? Same thing over here. So what exactly does the middle mean again? This means that you have, because it's in mole percent, and I drew it right in the middle, that means that it's 50 moles of A and 50 moles of B, or it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So, so not in a crystal structure together, it's just an equal amount. It is in a crystal structure together because we've labeled it beta, but which I is different than alpha and different than gamma. I thought you said that none of A could fit in B or be in A, so how can they make it Yeah, so pure alpha has a crystal structure. Let's call it cubic, right? If this one's cubic and this one's hexagonal, Imagine some new one, we'll call it tetragonal. We'll describe what that means later this semester. This is just a new way of arranging atoms. Okay? More questions I can answer? This stuff's a little bit confusing, so bear with me. We'll do lots of examples here. Um, okay, let's take a look at a common, this is one in the book. I'm going to draw a phase diagram from the book for magnesium and lead. The diagram looks something like this. You've got pure magnesium on one side lead over here, you have a eutectic point, there's your eutectic point, right? And then you've got this vertical line, and anytime you see a vertical line, almost always it represents what's called a line compound, meaning a single phase region that exists at a very narrow region of stoichiometry, right? And then you've got another um, eutectic over here. So what can we say about this system? Well, we could start labeling it for one thing. So let's go ahead and label this. We've got liquid up here. We're gonna follow our one, two, one, two rule. So going left to right from liquid, we can call this liquid plus alpha. We'll call this alpha. That makes this, um, that region right here is going to be liquid plus beta, and this must be beta. This must be beta plus something. This must be alpha plus something. Therefore, you know that this has to be a line compound. Because on either side of it, you have two phase regions. Therefore, that line itself must be a single phase region. Let's call it gamma. Beta plus gamma. Gamma plus liquid. Gamma plus liquid. Any questions on labeling that so far? The next question is, that doesn't occur. This is in weight percent. As a function of weight percent, uh, excuse me, that's supposed to be lead. When you plot this against weight percent lead, this line occurs at 81 weight percent lead. 81 weight percent lead. So the question that is totally fair game on a midterm would be to say, what is the chemical formula of the gamma phase? You know it's a mixture of lead and magnesium, but what is that mixture? Is it a 1 to 3, a 3 to 1, a 1 to 5, a 5 to 1? What is that, and how do you figure that out? So. How do we go about solving this question? How do we predict what the chemical formula of gamma is? What do you think, Josh? Uh, you have two gamma plus L's. Yeah. Yep. How, so how do we make sense of having two gamma plus L regions, right? So again, at any point, our one, two, one, two rule has to work. So I bring this down where I can reach it, right? If I go this way, I go one, two, one, two, one, two, right? That works. Up here, it also works. I got one, two, one, two, one. So what it's really saying is that whether you're here or here, you're gonna have a mixture of gamma plus L. What is different about those two fields? The comp, well, the weight percent depends on where you're at in these regions, but it's the composition of the liquid, right? If you are right here versus right here, you have two different compositions of liquid. Your liquid will be this composition over here, and your liquid will be that composition over here, right? So they're different, fair enough? Now, somebody help me, what's our strategy? If we were going to try and predict the formula of this intermediate compound gamma, again, gamma must exist right at that line. How do we predict this formula? What do you think, Rob? Well, I was going to ask, are we only able to predict the empirical formula? We can't predict the chemical formula. We can predict the chemical formula. How would you do it? 
Yeah, Brendan, what would you do? Uh, I'd just say we have 100 moles of this, and if it's 81 or like 100 kilograms, I guess. Yeah, because we're given in weight percent. So yeah. imagine you start out with 100 grams or 100 kilograms. And then you can say 81 kilograms of that is lead. How many moles is that? And then do the same thing for magnesium. That's exactly right. So we're going to set 100 grams to start with, right? If there's 100 grams of our total product, and we know that that is 81 weight percent lead, that we know that in our product we have 81 grams of, mag of lead, excuse me, and we must have, what is that, 19 grams of magnesium. If we can figure out the number of moles of lead and the moles of magnesium, we can take their ratio and we can figure out the composition of this, the chemical form of this. So why don't you take a stab at that? That'll be our next clicker question, which is, again, what would be the chemical formula of this intermediate compound? Yeah. How would the love molecule be affected by the gamma plus gamma? How would that be the gamma plus Okay, so again, you can follow along. I've written out how many moles of lead and how many moles of magnesium I get. I'm going to keep working on it. Once you have the number of moles of each, then think, okay, what's my ratio? Once you have the ratio, you can use that to determine the chemical formula. So if you have questions, raise your hand if you've got some TAs here.
okay, getting lots and lots of questions about how you want me to, how you're supposed to type this in. If by the time you take the ratio and you figure out that there's twice as much magnesium as lead, for example, you would just punch in MG2PB in the clicker, right? So this is a free point for being here. You don't need to do subscripts, just type in MG2PB. And again, on a test, we're really flexible in interpreting this. Clicker's not super flexible, so it has to be this way to put it in. Generally, how do you know which way to write these formulas? The general rule is you do it in alphabetical order. Because M comes before P, you typically would start with magnesium. They break that rule sometimes, but that's the general rule. More commonly, they'll write cation than anion. So it's either alphabetical or cation than anion. So for like two metals, it would just be alphabetical. Generally, like two metals, like base and like just like some And also, okay, so go ahead and type in that answer. We're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Like convention, we reduce it to lowest common. Okay, we're going to wrap up this poll. Everyone should be getting this right, so I'm just going to skip ahead. Good. Okay. So that is, it's pretty straightforward. If these things are plotted in weight percent, you need to convert, you need to go from weight percent to number of moles, and then you divide it. What if when you divided it, you got moles of A over moles of B came out to be 1.5 or something, not an integer value? What do you do? Multiply, multiply until you get integers, right? So multiply both by two, that means that you'd have A to B3, right? It, the ratio still is one and a half, right? But make sure it's integers is typically what we do on these. Um, if this is plotted in mole percent, it can be really easy, right? If this is in mole percent, um, B, going from pure A to pure B, and you see a line compound exactly at one fourth of the way across, what's the comp chemical formula? Well, one fourth of the way across means that you have, if you divide that into four sections, three of them come from A and one comes from B, so it would be A3B, right? A3B. If it was exactly half and half, we know it would just be AB. If it was three quarters the way across, it would be AB3. If it was at 80%, which is dividing it into fifths, that would be AB4, right? So these ones are pretty easy. If it's plotted in mole percent, it's pretty easy to do. If it's in weight percent, you've got to convert it to moles first and then divide to get the ratio. Um, I've done an example problem with this. I posted it on the uh, list of MSC example problems. By the way, if you haven't seen that, there's two playlists for this class. One is the lectures we do in class, and one is example problems. So I posted one where we do uh, actually calculations more on this. So if you have more questions, take a look at that. I'm going to keep going for now. Can I answer any last quick questions about this? Yeah, Rosa? Uh, this one? Good question. Well, if, if this is at one quarter of the way across, that means that there are 25% B. So let's say there's 25 moles of B, but there's 75 moles of A, and 25 divided by 75 is a one to three ratio. Okay, let's take a look at this, this uh, diagram here. This is going between pure aluminum and pure calcium. In this phase diagram, there exists what's called a congruent melting temperature, or a congruently melting compound, and an incongruently melting compound, right? So congruent versus incongruent melting, what's the difference? A congruently melting compound is one that goes from liquid to solid with no change in composition. So I think Logan asked this earlier. If you take a line compound and you heat it up, Right? This line compound is exactly 33 mole percent calcium. And as soon as you melt it, you end up with liquid, which has the exact same composition, 33 mole percent. So that would be an example of a congruent melting point. Yeah, if it goes between liquid and solid, either upon heating or cooling, and there's no change in composition, we call that congruent melting. So there's actually two other congruent melting points on this diagram, but they're a little bit tricky. Where are they at? 
Yeah, uh, Spencer. Not the eutectic, because there you go from a liquid and it splits to two different compositions. We'll show why in a moment. 20, nope. It's actually the pure components. So right here, if you have pure calcium, it would actually melt to pure liquid calcium. So the composition doesn't change, and pure aluminum does the same thing over there. So why is this point, let me change colors now, why is that point incongruent melting, right? Well, because above that point, you're going to be cooling it down. You have a mixture of what we'll call liquid plus, you know, it's Al2Ca. Let's just call it beta, that Al2Ca compound. But as soon as you go down, you're going to form a solid, which is Al4Ca, right? So your liquid right above that point is going to have this composition just as you're cooling it down. Your solid is going to have that composition. But when you cool it down across that paratectic reaction, you form a new solid and it has a different composition. So any paratectic point you see is always an incongruent melting point. Can I clarify anything on congruent versus incongruent melting? Why is the eutectic not? Let me change color again. This is not a um, congruent melting point because there you go from liquid above to two different solids. The liquid has this composition, but the solid has this composition and that composition. So there's definitely a change in composition as you cool below that point. Yeah, Rosa? Composition, same as chemical formula? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's related. Usually from composition, you write the chemical formula such that you have integer values. Um, composition would be something like this, like what's the composition of Al4C? You'd say that it is 20 atomic or mole percent calcium. That's its composition and therefore 80 atomic percent aluminum. Sorry, one more time. If it's at a fixed point, no. Okay. Anything else I can answer about this? Yeah, uh, Anthony? Good question. This is the congruent melting point right there. This is not a congruent melting point. Okay. Yeah. So the point. The point itself is a congruent melting point. Okay? Yeah. You can't see the point. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think we can just zoom. Right? So the at the top here, this is our congruent melting point, that big red one at the top of that. Because if you were to heat it, it would go to a liquid with no change in composition. Or if you were to cool it, it would go to solid, no change in composition. But right here, just above this point, you have solid with this composition. You've got liquid with that composition. If you cool it down, you have a new, different type of solid with a different composition from the solid before. Incongruent melting. It's a change in composition. Or in other words, what this requires is it requires diffusion of atoms, right? Meaning atoms have to move around. Here you have more calcium than, than you had here. So as you cool this down, you have to diffuse calcium from one of your, sorry, if you, you have to lose some calcium uh, to form this compound. Okay? So is a one base two or two one. Yeah. Okay. Let's do, we've already done that one. Let me just do one last example. Let me just prime you for the lever rule, which we'll have to get to next time. Um, you'll need this on the homework anyways. How the lever rule works is if you have a two-phase region, let's call this just alpha. You've got liquid plus alpha. And you have a certain composition, right? At any given temperature, we can use the lever rule to tell us how much these phases are present. So for example, right here, we can make this big. At right there, we could draw a flat line all the way across this thing. And we can use the lever rule. How the lever rule works is you take the total distance, when you take the intersection of these two points, that total distance from there to there, right? And you need to figure out the distance of each segment above. So from here to here, and from here to here. 
And if you want to figure out the weight fraction of the faces present, you're going to divide these things. So this is how it works. Let me change color one last time. The weight fraction of the alpha phase is going to be equal to the purple <coughs> divided by the blue. And the weight percent of the liquid phase is going to be equal to the green divided by the blue. Or in other words, if you want the phase, let me lower that just a little bit. If you want the phase on the left, then you need to take the line opposite it divided by the total length. If you want the phase on the right, you take the section opposite of it and divide it by that. How are you going to remember that? The way to remember it is if you're close to this line, you should have mostly this material. And the only way that'll work is if you're taking this length as longer than uh, this length, right? If you're over here, you should have mostly alpha phase. So you're going to want to take that length of the line divided by the whole, not the small section, right? That is the lever rule. If the plot is given in weight percent, as it is in here, then the fraction of your phases will be in weight percent. If this was given in mole percent, you'd be calculating the mole fraction of your two different phases. Okay, we'll pick up here next time, and then we'll do a little bit of review and get ready for the test on Friday. I have a quick question about yeah. that.